2021 planning conference. Um, we will be encouraging you to use the hashtag, hashtag NCAAC21 during the conference. Um, we are happy to offer, the, uh, offer this conference for free this year and are grateful that so many of you will be joining us virtually once again this year. We hope to meet in person once again next year. We have been working hard to plan a virtual conference that will allow our members to participate in live sessions during the week. We have also updated our online schedule to include nine pre-recorded sessions that you can review in your free time. We will also be posting information on how to listen to all the sessions, including the live sessions on demand following the conference. I know everyone is continuing to manage their way through the COVID-19 pandemic in their own way, and hopefully we're getting ready to transition back into a more in-person life. We have learned a lot from last year's conference, and so we tried to set up the schedule so it works within your workday with morning sessions at night, nine o'clock, and noon sessions during the lunch hour and four o'clock sessions at the end of the day. Last year's conference talked a lot about the new normal and included working from home and virtual public meetings to working on strategies to help your organization and jurisdiction and clients successfully navigate these challenges. But we hope that this year's conference will highlight some of what this region's really known for, innovation and inspiration of others along across the country with our great planners and our great projects. The NCAC board has continued to regularly meet virtually um, on a monthly basis, and we have been discussing ways to support our members and now and after the pandemic. We encourage you to get involved, um, and specifically, we just lost our vice president of communication, Kate Powers, who has taken a role outside the region. Um, and so if you have strong communication skills, and free time, please reach out to me. Um, one of the best benefits of our chapter has been our small geography and our ability usually to meet in person. Um, so we're really hoping to bring that back next year. Um, one of the, our crowning achievements on the board this year, or one of the things we're really proud of is that our Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Scholarship, which was founded in 2020, as part of the chapter level commitment to dismantling institutional racism, including the planning profession's role in creating and perpetuating disparities in health and wealth in the United States, the scholarship reflects the chapter level commitment to increase representation in the region's next generation of planners and border field planning fields. I'd like to, enter, uh, to highlight this year's scholarship winners from George Washington University, Tambo Price, a first year student who works full time at the architect of the Capitol. Ariel Lofton, the, the current student who works for Montgomery County and manages their community garden program. And from Georgetown University, Shanette Orr, current student who works full time as a civil engineer at Arlington County, and Cynthia Ann Cuestas, first year student who works at Montgomery County Food Council. And from the University of Maryland, Asia Jones, a dual degree student in seeking a master's in public health and community planning, and Redondin Kabir Kachik, first year student and an architect from Bangladesh. Um, I would like to thank Don Ziegler, our Vice President of Diversity and Outreach for running this program, as well as our successful equity panel earlier this year. I wanna thank all of you, or everyone who has worked on planning and running this conference, specifically Mark Lewis de Grace, our Professional Development Officer, and Raz Tafari Candy, the second, um, PDO elect um, have been working hard to make this happen. And a big thanks to Clark Larson and Kayla Anthony, as well as Nick Crasher, uh, Margaret Rifkin, and Paul Moyer, who rounded out our conference committee. Um, without their help, 
this would not have gotten to this point. And thank you all to all the great panelists this year who really make this the best um, conference and a great way to show the talents of our region. Um, as a reminder to all of you, the chapter does not have any professional staff. So everything you, you see related to the conference and other chapter activities are a result of hard work of our volunteer board. I want to thank them for their continued dedication to the chapter. And I hope that some of you listening today consider running for the board in the future. Um, next, I'll turn it over to our vice president elect, Scott Rowe, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Elena Proust. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, it's really exciting to see everyone here this morning. Um, I think we have a great conference ahead of us, as Jeremy stated. Um, I'm excited this morning to present this morning's keynote speaker, Alina Proust. Ms. Proust is the founder of Recast City, LLC, and author of Recast Your City, How to Save Your Downtown with Small Scale Manufacturing. Many of you are familiar with her work and we're excited to have her here this morning to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, she works with local leaders, real estate developers, city and other civic leaders to integrate space for small scale producers into redevelopment projects and place-based economic development. She is passionate about making great places um, and sees that small scale manufacturing is a missing piece in today's real estate and economic development efforts. Ms. Proust works closely with local leaders, real estate developers, city and other civic leaders to integrate these spaces uh, for small scale producers into redevelopment projects and place-based economic development, something that's really near and dear uh, to our hearts here in the Washington DC region. Uh, she's passionate about making great places and sees that small scale manufacturers are the missing piece, as I said. Um, I mentioned the book, uh, Recast Your City. It's available through Island Press and pretty much anywhere books are sold. Uh, without further ado, I'm very pleased to present Alana Proust. Thank you so much, Scott. And thank you everybody for joining this morning. I hope you have your cup of coffee with you. Um, and I hope you can hear me just fine coming through. So I'm going to share my screen um, and just sort of hop into this. I hope that what I want to do is really talk about our role in all of this, right? I, my, my background is in city planning. Um, I see a lot of the work that we do as a field in terms of how we're creating places that people love. And it's always been the way that I've thought about the work that we do. And we'll talk about that a little, a little bit later, but, but the thing I want you to really think about is the, the role that we have, the role that our field has in really saving the soul of a place. And I don't know if that's the way you think about it, your work, but it's the way I think about our work. And, you know, as we're just sort of all settling in as in this morning Monday, which I think is always a good place to start. I just want you to think about what does our recovery have to do with all of this, right? We're, we're, we are in the thick of the pandemic. We're not actually coming out of the pandemic right now. We're in the thick of it. Um, and our work in this region has everything to do with both recovery and how that gets expressed at the neighborhood level, let alone at the city or regional level. Because to me, this all has to do with the expression of the personality of a place in its storefronts. And the role of our work to create these places that have that personality, because that personality is so much about the energy and the resilience and the vibrancy of a place. But the reality is, is that over time, we also, our market is pretty hot, so we don't have too much of this left, but we do have a history of neglect of certain places and certain people within our community. And so I think it's important to think about, yes, yes, we have a role in this. Yes, we have a role in recovery as a community of planners and people adjacent to the planning field. Um, and also thinking about what is our role to do that in an equitable way? And I, I appreciate the work that you guys are doing to create this scholarship program as well. 
because if we think about the big cities in our region and, even, and the small towns or the small community centers, the neighborhood centers in our region, this is, this is about community, right? This is about where people come together. This is about the pride of the neighborhood. Um, and it's also about who belongs. And I think this question of who belongs is something that we as a region are struggling with. And, and part of that is because of the pandemic, the, the number of small businesses that close, the number of vacancies that we have in the region, even in a market that's been hot for a very long time, um, but also the displacement that's taking place, um, the, the pushing out of older businesses and of commercial properties um, in our older corridors that are getting redeveloped. And what is our role and responsibility in creating spaces for local businesses? I know and I saw a number of, of familiar faces pop up on the participant list. So uh, great to see some friendly faces or friendly names in there, but to everybody who I haven't met before, uh, I am local. Uh, I am, uh, I am a, a DC area native, um, but uh, just by way of background on the left, you can see a, a picture of me from high school. I'm a Walter Johnson high school kid. Um, but my mother sewed that dress. She made it out of electric, this electric blue material. Um, she sewed, she knit, she quilted, she painted, she taught us all how to use drills um, and fix things. Um, and that was a big part of, of my upbringing. And on the right, I had a, a wonderful opportunity to give a TEDx talk at GW TEDx uh, a number of years ago now, all about the economic power of great places. Um, the other power behind me is these great teens that are growing up in this area. Uh, one who's in college and, and one who's still around here at Blair High School and um, teaching them how to use trills and, and build things and, and create things and also um, just a love for the for the DC area. Um, my background in all of this uh, comes from the Smart Growth world. I was at the EPA Smart Growth Office and then uh, Vice President, Chief of Staff at Smart Growth America for a long time. Um, but about seven years ago, I launched Recast City, almost exactly seven years ago, in fact. And um, I created Recast City because I recognize that as the community of planners, as community of, of a community of people doing um, place reinvestment, um, community development, um, real estate, economic development, all of that mashup that we all actually live in on a day-to-day -day basis for the most part, um, we would talk about jobs, housing, balance, and we would talk about inclusion, and we wouldn't talk about what kinds of businesses or who would benefit from that work, who would benefit from the investment. And I created Recast City in this recognition that there are roles of small businesses in our community development that we have to pay really detailed attention to. And it's not just about mixed use. It's not just about um, wanting to have affordable housing, all important things, um, but it's about who should benefit from the space, who should benefit from the commercial space, whose businesses are going to be disaster proof now that we're in this era, um, what kind of businesses are more disaster proof in our community? How do we help more people build their household or personal wealth so that they're breaking out of cycles of poverty so that they have a seat at the table? All of these questions were flying around my head for a long time as I created Recast City. And so Recast City is, is my focus to work with communities to bring small scale manufacturing businesses into neighborhood Main Street or downtown redevelopment in an effort to create more opportunity for more people and create these energized places that have a long lasting sort of timeline to their resilience and their economic impact. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that, but I, I wanna sort of take a step back and I'm gonna tell you things you probably know really well, but, but this, this question of what does it mean for a place to have a heart, right? When we're talking about the soul of the community, it's really about the heart of a place, not only do we love that place, but does our place feel valued? Or is there is that a question of our, how our neighbors are investing in this place or spending time in that place? Is it a question, is the jurisdiction spending money and time in that place? Um, but really, what does it mean for a place to have heart? And, and really positioning all of that in the reality of where we are today, right? Today's struggle is, is complex. It is not just the pandemic, it's in fact, uh, compounded by this reality that our economic development and our planning actions of the past have excluded some people in some places, right? The systemic racism baked into our economic development and planning profession um, is, is real today um, as much as we're working on it actively, and I hope you all are, um, you know, it is, it is very much a reality of what we're dealing with today and how that impacts not only our places, but economic opportunity even to have a, a business in a storefront. So 
the question I always ask is, well, what are we doing about it now? Because for me, this is all about what actions can we take today to make a real difference in people's lives? So I have to start with the reality of, of what COVID has done, right? The loss of life in our country, which I think we got through so much of last year and the trauma of, of everything shutting down last year that people don't wanna talk about this. People wanna move on, people wanna look forward, um, but this is a really important part of who we are right now. And the, the mourning that our country is going through, whether or not it's talking about it or not, that people in our communities are, are mourning this, um, whether we're talking about it or not. And that this impacts our economy, this impacts our places, this impacts the people who live in our, in our region. The other part to recognize is that the vast majority of businesses closed last year. Right. And, and it's also hard to remember this almost at certain points where, you know, all of these businesses, all of our storefronts closed for multiple months. And the impact on black owned businesses and Latino owned businesses was tw twice the impact on white owned businesses, twice as many black and Latino owned businesses closed as white owned businesses. And so the impact on our local economy, on our places, on who has access to opportunity here is different. And then we have these crazy things. So um, I don't know how much anybody else pays attention to economic impact analyses. It's one of those things I used to do in a past life. Um, so whenever we look at the impact of new job growth, we rarely are looking at the different types of jobs, the, the income of different job types. Um, if we're recruiting for jobs and we're talking about direct and indirect job growth, when we talk about indirect job growth, nine times out of 10, we're talking about low income wages in retail or service jobs. And we've done this for a long time. Um, this isn't a new thing, but it, during the pandemic, we've lost a huge number of low income jobs. Uh, there, there's tons of news going on about this, the, the labor shortage, which is really an income, a wage shortage, right? That we have all of these businesses that are set, that are created based on needing low wage employees where people have said, I want a higher quality of life, I can get a better job, a better paying job. And so the question then is, as we're one of the questions, as, we, as we're coming through COVID and the pandemic, how do we create more middle income jobs that allow people to break out of cycles of poverty? Um, how do we invest our space and our money and our energy in creating more opportunity for more people? We've already lost a ton of these jobs, so let's grow the sectors that we really need. But before COVID, on a national basis, we were also already seeing a lot of places struggle. The vast majority of places were losing working age adult population. That's brain drain, that's um, the aging of our population. Um, most of DC wasn't seeing this issue, but or the DC region, but, but this is a reality of the shifting winds of what's going on across our country. Nationally, we also saw the highest income inequity we've ever recorded in our history. Right, the distance between the haves and the have nots in our country is the widest it has ever been before we hit COVID. And that's really a symptom of these broader problems. On top of that, we know that there is an enormous racial wealth gap. And this is a, a key part of what we need to look at, right? And that we, you know, different studies are showing this, this gap. Um, but generally showing that the net worth of a median white household is 10 times that of a black household. And the same holds true of a Latino Hispanic household. That this is an enormous gap and it's it, and for black households, it's not just about, um, it's about both historic inequities and the lack of good paying jobs today. And when we, this is something you guys I'm sure are well versed at, right? But our role in housing and not giving out FHA loans to um, black households um, after World War II, the red line, Fair Labor Act that said that the, we, the industries that were predominantly not white weren't going to have to pay fair labor wages. Um, the riots in the 60s and banks unwilling to give commercial loans to black property owners to rehab those places. And those places are now the hottest parts of our DC market in many cases, right? There are all of these things that have impacted um, the ability of a black household to build wealth and that we have a responsibility. I believe we have a responsibility to really change the way that we invest our money, both in businesses, as well as in spaces, in real estate, to make a different, create a different outcome now. 
And then on top of that, we have this real challenge around vacant properties that is only compounded now in the, the broader region. We know vacant properties, commercial properties have an enormous impact on nearby property values. We know that retail has really consolidated in a lot of play, ways. The national chains don't wanna be everywhere. They wanna be in a few very prime locations. Um, and that when we look in our broader region and nationally, there's in fact a job loss that's been going on in non-metro areas. And how is that impacting our area? And how are we creating job opportunity for people as they migrate across the country? So what does all of this have to do with neighborhoods and economic recovery? I think it's really important to just make sure we're, we're, we're clear about the reality that we're operating in today and that we are at a transformational moment. We are at a transformation, transformational moment for a number of reasons. COVID's one of them. Um, the American Rescue Plan Act funding that's out there is another one. But there are a lot of different things that are changing. And, and one of the opportunities in all of these winds of change is the adoption of all of these different business models that had been going on over the last 10, 15 years, but have only accelerated into this technological adoption that's going on. I want to give you a few examples of who I'm talking about. And, and this is really exciting for me because um, you guys are local and so you can go visit these places. Um, and I, I think it's just a really exciting thing for you to be able to, to experience these things and, and be able to visit them. So first I want to tell you about CO Ceramics. CO Ceramics um, is an amazing business right here in DC. They're on the, in the Art Walk at Monroe Street Market. And um, they are a small scale manufacturing business. So th these are the stories that I'm gonna tell you. So small scale manufacturing businesses in the broadest sense are any business that creates a tangible product that you can replicate or package. My shorthands for it are hot sauce, handbags or hardware or artisans to advance manufacturing. Anybody who's making a product in our area is generally gonna be one to 50 employees. In a smaller town, it might be one to 20 employees. One of the reasons that they're really exciting is because they fit into the fabric of our neighborhood. They're modern manufacturing, they're great neighbors. They're actually a, a draw of foot traffic because you can look in the window or come in the shop and see something being made. And that's an enormous draw. One of the other great benefits of them is that they both sell in person and online, or at least are, are generally online, if not also in person. So I met CEO Ceramics at the Tacoma Park Street Festival. I'm, I'm sort of a pain when I go to street festivals because I saw Bennett vendors all the time to talk to them. So CEO Ceramics makes ceramic uh, jewelry, earrings, um, brettes, other things, and, and other sort of household items. Beautiful, beautiful, bright, bright colors. I highly recommend you check them out. CEO Ceramics was a vendor at the, farm, at the market, at the street market. They also have a storefront, as I said, in Monroe Street Market at the Art Walk. This is micro retail. This is micro retail where each business has between, if you haven't been there before, more or less between 400 and 800 square feet. The bathrooms are shared. There's shared facilities behind the storefronts. And it's predominantly an area of artisans, people producing some good and selling it out of that storefront. So CO Ceramics was at the market. They have a storefront where they're making their things and selling their things. They're selling online direct to consumers and they sell wholesale. So all of a sudden we're looking at a business that has four different sources of revenue coming into their micro retail space, which is going to make them much more resilient to when the winds of being people coming into a store or looking online or selling through wholesale or, or being able to come to these events in person, they have this mix of revenues that makes them more resilient. Now this is a, a they're on a micro space. Um, the businesses and in uh, Monroe Street Market are generally between one and four bit. Uh, employees um, because these are small spaces, but uh, the commitment from the de original development is that these ground floor spaces are committed to below market commercial rates for 30 years for the artisan community around this at Brooklyn Metro Station. This is a commitment of a public good as part of this development, right? The commercial space is part of the public good, not just the affordable housing. So this is this is one of the ways that we get there when we're thinking about planning spaces, especially new construction, is what is the role of new real estate to create spaces for small businesses in our community, affordable spaces that are in a state of good repair at the size that our businesses need it. I'll give you another example. This was from a small town in Alabama. 
uh, Heflin, Alabama, they have uh, turkey calls, uh, hand created uh, turkey calls. Um, they predominantly sell online direct to consumer as well as uh, wholesale. But during the pandemic, there were so many people traveling, looking at doing outdoor recreation that they had people starting to show up at their workshop in this small town. Their workshop is just two blocks off of their main street. And so people were showing up and all of a sudden when I was interviewing them for our work there, um, they were starting to talk about, well, maybe we create, need to create a small amount of retail frontage and a glass window so people can see the production because that's why people were showing up. They wanted to see the production of the thing that they had bought. So these product businesses, and they, they um, employ a few dozen people, right? So they're on a bigger scale and they're mostly, they're all direct to consumer or wholesale. They don't have a retail presence yet, but that's the direction they're gonna go next, right? So these are the different ways to look at how a product business can be a draw. Um, they can sell in multiple, through multiple avenues and they can do this online offline combination that really starts creating this magic of a draw to a place. I'll give you a third option, third example. This is also, this is a DC one also, this is mess hall, commercial shared kitchen. A commercial shared kitchen is something in the DC area we now have in a number of different places. There's one in Fairfax County. There's a number of them in DC. This is a, a kind of shared space that's growing. Um, for those who might not be as familiar with commercial shared kitchen, a business owner can come in and pay to use the space for a few hours a week or a lot of hours a week um, in some spaces. In other parts of the country, they have a dedicated bay that's just theirs. Um, but this is about sharing the cost um, of, of the resources. So you don't have to have the investment of uh, one space that you're going to be investing the hundreds of thousands of dollars to create a commercial kitchen just for yourself. This is that increment. Whisked is a great example for anybody who knows that cookie and dessert company here in the DC area. Um, they started by um, working in a commercial kitchen of a restaurant on the hours where the restaurant was closed. So they, was, they were doing production from like 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. It was insane. Then they ended up in a commercial kitchen and now they're, they've moved into their own space. And it was because of the access to these kinds of spaces that really allowed them to grow. The other kinds of things to look at are shared spaces. And we have a few of those in DC too, where a specific building gets rehabbed and is um, provided for different small scale producers. So think co-work for small scale manufacturing. This is an example in Philadelphia called Macon Studios, but in DC we have uh, 520, we have off the beaten track. There are a few spaces like this in DC um, where different producers have their own space or might share their one space with another business or two, um, but they're doing full their full production in that space. Also is easier for them to have a building that somebody else is managing. And one of the other benefits is that small scale manufacturers don't need the industrial space that we have on the fringes. Um, they don't need 100,000 square feet. A lot of them need 1,000 or 2,000 square feet. And there's an endless, more or less an endless demand for stuff that's around 500 square feet. So those are the small scale manufacturers. So then the question is, how do we sort of, where does all of this come together? And this is what I want, really wanna focus on because when we wanna build a strong and inclusive economy and create the thriving communities all over our region, it's really about how these pieces come together and that we can invest in a better way and grow in a better way, but we need to act with intention and purpose. And this is the really the important part to me is to think about what we're doing and why we're doing it um, and do this in a way that addresses racial inequities and place inequities that we have created in the past through planning and economic decision making um, and create these places that people love and that does draw in others, but benefits the people who live there now as the priority. And, the, and there's really four key steps and, and none of this is going to be shocking to you, but I think it's really important to think about the order of operations of our work sometimes. One is that we need to invest in the people who live there now. Who has these small scale manufacturing businesses? They're everywhere, right? They're in, I've worked in really big cities and in neighborhoods in those cities in really small towns. There are people who make things everywhere. Um, we need to invest in the people who live there now. How did we help them have stronger businesses, scaling businesses, build their revenues, whatever is their goal? Then how do we invest in that place with those people? so that we, there is space for those businesses so they can scale and stay in those communities? How do we create a new structure to support and scale the investment in these places? And then how do we think long-term but act now? Um, I'm probably one of the most impatient planners out there, 
but really thinking about that people can't wait. Like the need for help is so real right now. Um, there are so many businesses that made it through last year because there were so there was so much support thrown at people last year that are really struggling today because of labor, because of shipping, because of a whole, because people aren't spending as much money with local small businesses right now because the attention isn't there. A whole bunch of reasons why, but we need to act now. So I always work with folks to say, what can we do in the next six months that are going, that's going to start making a meaningful difference for people? So small scale manufacturers are these hidden gems. They're, they're really, um, they really are everywhere and they can make a big difference in a lot of different ways. So what are some of the benefits of bringing these businesses into our communities, into our development projects, into our rehab projects, and into our planning decision making? So we can invest in businesses that help more people build household wealth. This is something I've obviously mentioned already. Um, we have a heritage of making things in every different part of our population across racial, ethnic, immigrant, income, ability, age, sexual orientation, whatever that divide is that we've identified in our communities, people make stuff and people make stuff as a business. They might make it part-time and have aspirations to be full-time. They might be full-time at home and bursting at the seams and need a space to grow into. They might already be in a space and wanna be a part of a stronger community of producers. But people make things across all different parts of our population. And we have an opportunity to help those households build their wealth um, to have broader impacts on their community and on their neighborhood. Second, we do have this opportunity to build it in a more in inclusive way and bring wealth into the community. So when these businesses are selling online, they're not only selling across the region, but they're potentially selling nationally and even maybe internationally. And that quite literally means they're bringing dollars into that neighborhood that can be recirculated as well. The other benefit of this business type is that they fill storefronts, that because they're selling in person and online, it is this magic ability to be the draw without being dependent on the foot traffic. This is a great business, it's not local, um, but she has makes soaps off to the side. She had this, has this big cauldron where she can make the soaps while the store is slow. So she has one space that she can sell and produce in and she can have one person staff the whole thing. That's cost efficient for her in a lot of ways, but because she's selling online and in person, if it's a slow foot traffic day, or maybe in an area that hasn't built up its foot traffic yet, it is a really strong way to help draw people in because as I said, people love seeing things made. Uh, a great DC example is Zeke's Coffee. Uh, I don't know who, if anybody has been to Zeke's on Rhode Island Avenue in DC. Um, Zeke's moved into a vacant storefront when they moved in. This block had a number of, of vacancies when they moved in. Zeke's is coffee shop up in the front and coffee roaster in the back and regional distribution for their wholesale side goes out the back door, right? So they have all of these different revenue sources in this one space and they could be the draw on this block but their revenue wasn't going to be dependent on the foot traffic. But lo and behold, obviously, once you have a coffee shop on the street, it draws foot traffic. And then that foot traffic helped draw other businesses to fill other storefronts on this block. And then when we take care of our business owners, we attract other business owners. I promise you that this is a very tight knit community. Um, for instance, Knoxville is known as a place that supports its small scale manufacturers and actually draws people into the city because of that benefit. So when we take care of our business owners, they want to be a part of more people want to be a part of our, our what we're building. And we draw entrepreneurs from within our community, from within our neighborhoods, but also from other parts of the country. So all of these pieces are part of a thriving economy. And when we worked with Columbia, Missouri, one of the things that was really interesting to me is we weren't in downtown. We were on a, a commercial corridor north of downtown um, where the property owners had gotten together to create an improvement district. And, and one of the things that they realized as we went through this was that there was this hidden economic engine that was just sort of chugging along that nobody was paying attention to, nobody was creating a home for, um, and that they could really capitalize on, on that as not only as part of their brand, but really as part of the, the way that this area was going to develop and who they were going to be for. One of the th first things that they did after we worked with them was launch a commercial shared kitchen because of the spaces and partnerships in place. They also changed their, their zoning to allow artisan industry or you can call it artisan manufacturing to make sure it's an allowable use. So the, I do think that we are in this unique moment though for a couple of reasons. One is the access to the American Rescue Plan Act money. 
that's a lot of money that went to to a, a number of different jurisdictions, and it it is intended to be focused on economic recovery. So the opportunity we have to support existing businesses and their growth and their resilience, and that comes down to business development support, affordable space, and capital investment. Those are three, uh, not both. All three of those um, is a big part of what we're talking about here. We also have a recognition that downtowns and neighborhood centers really do attract entrepreneurs and attract energy. And so there is an energy to continue to invest in these places. Uh, the challenge in that is making sure that we're doing it with the people who live there now. And there is this broader understanding that if our small businesses fail, we fail. But we have to tap back into that. That was really the strong identity of our places last year. Um, and I think we have to get back to that. So what does it mean to make something happen in all of this? Um, the, the introductions did mention my book. Um, I, I would love for you to, to read it, but at least check out the first chapter. You can get that for free at the book website, recastyourcity.com. Um, feel free to download the first chapter and, and you can get a lot more detail, not only about what I'm talking about with small-scale manufacturing, but the how-to part of it. This book is a, is a DIY, <laughs> I think of it as like a city self-help book. It's, it's got five steps. Um, it's got worksheets. It's really about taking this concept and, and applying it within your own space, within your own work. And I hope it's helpful to the work that you're doing. So to me, it is all about taking action. Um, and what do we do to create these great places, but also to save small businesses? So I got I have five actions you can think about already. One is create affordable space for a diversity of small businesses. What does that mean to have both affordable and spaces and and a diversity of small businesses. Who gets the storefronts is the, the way I ask the question. What size storefronts do local businesses need? The only way we find that out is by talking to the local business owners um, and understanding what kind of spaces they're in now or what kind of spaces they'd wanna be in and what does it mean for them to have affordable space? We have a lack of, we have very few micro retail spaces in our region um, and there is an enormous demand for these spaces um, You know, between 500 and, and 800 square feet. Um, there's a development in Ithaca, New York that created a series of micro retail spaces that were as small as 300 square feet. Um, and they talked about how they were making above market rate. Ithaca is not the same market as us, but it's not a, it's not a weak market, but they were making above market rate, rate on a per square foot basis because those businesses were thinking about a flat rate for that space, not on a, a per square foot cost. Um, and so really thinking about what does it mean to create different size spaces for different kinds of businesses in our community and the way that that has changed over the last five years, right? When the big companies have consolidated, we have these big 5,000, 10,000 square foot spaces that are there. How do we rehab them in a way that creates a series of small spaces or front and back kinds of uses or alleyway facing opportunities? Second, we have to fill in the gap in business assistance with local initiatives. So that might mean providing assistance in multiple languages. We certainly have a lot of languages in the DC region, but that also means new partnerships, working with faith organizations, neighborhood leaders, cultural groups to share information and reach their networks. In the book, I talk about connectors, um, people who believe in their community, but are also uh, trusted by their community. You need both, um, believe in the community and are trusted by the community. Um, and really what it means to build a new relationship with a community leader who is a connector um, and, and get them engaged and ask for, for their interest in partnering with you on, on getting this information out because we do have trust issues, right? This is not a new thing, but I think it's really important to talk about that we have a lack of trust um, because of these historic things that we've done in a lot of communities. And that continue to happen in a lot of cases. And then I suggest we focus first on the support for existing businesses and helping them scale um, versus startups. They're a safer bet. Uh, startups are highest risk. Um, so uh, supporting folks that have already created a product, are marketing it, are selling it, um, they have some sense of how it all works is going to be a, a better investment. Third is targeting our investment models. What kind of capital do businesses need? Is there a micro grant loan program needed? We are very lucky in the DC region um, that we have WACIF um, and we have uh, LEDC, two amazing CDFIs that most other regions don't get to benefit from. Um, but really thinking about what else, what are the other gaps? How are we helping particularly black owned businesses, Latino owned businesses and other business owners of color be able to scale where they didn't have access to investment in the past? And then, yes, it is about prepping the policies. It is about changing zoning to make sure that we're including artisan manufacturing. There are simple 
language definitions that changes that a number of jurisdictions around here have done, um, but really making sure that these are allowable uses in as many places as possible so that we have we're removing barriers to entry as much, much as possible and making sure that the, um, the occupancy permit process is also um, not this black box that nobody understands as a small business how to get through, which is a different kind of challenge. And then building community pride, right? Holiday markets are a great way to do this. All the festivals that we we used to have that are starting to come back now are an important part of this because there is nothing like being able to go down the street like I did and see a local vendor like CO Ceramics and talk with them and really give people the opportunity to be proud of what their city is about and what their community is about. And that that is a real key part of our economic development. So if you're ready to act, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we work with folks. Uh, our Recast Leaders 2022 cohort program is, uh, the applications are open now if you're interested in your community um, making this happen next year. Um, but you can also reach out directly to me anytime. I'm LinkedIn where I live mostly um, and uh, share the cool stuff that I see other communities happening or you can always email me directly. Um, and to me, this really all comes down to the places we want to make, the way that we want to bring people together and the opportunity through planning and economic development decision making to create the space and the structures to help more people be proud of the businesses that they're creating and the good paying jobs that they're creating. I forgot to mention these businesses are generally creating jobs that are paying 50 to 100 percent more than retailer service jobs. So this is a way to create more good middle income jobs in the community and create jobs that people are proud of. And it does take leadership. It takes political leadership, it takes administrative leadership, and but it makes takes personal leadership too to make these kinds of commitments. So I hope you take away pieces from this, but that really it is about saving the heart of our communities and it is definitely worth it. Um, and I'd be happy to, oh, this is all the different information to reach me. But um, if you do want to buy your own copy of the book, um, you can get it from Island Press at 20% off if you use promo code RECAST. And with that, uh, I'm going to invite you all to toss your questions into the chat, uh, and we'll go from there. So scrolling back up to the Q&A. So one of the questions that came in, thank you so much for all the questions. Wow, these are fantastic. Um, one of the questions that came in said, do I think that cities should create a program similar to MPDUs in housing for small businesses that provide rent subsidies? So moderate, moderately priced dwelling units, um, for those, I can't, I can't imagine that anybody around here doesn't know what they are, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna define as I go because I don't believe in being wonky um, when, you know, when we're in large community settings. So um, moderately priced dwelling units, uh, in, at least in Montgomery County, it says that if you're gonna build X number of units of housing, you have to have X percent uh, set aside at moderate prices in DC. That's an inclusionary zoning. Different communities call it different things. Yes, I 100% think that we need include inclusionary commercial zoning. Um, it's something, in fact, I've proposed in a number of different cities. Um, San Francisco um, has an interesting way of getting there where they had an overlay zone that they created that said that the, the ground floor or some of the ground floor of certain buildings had to have smaller footprint spaces. Um, that's one of the ways of getting there. But I do think that um, commercial space in general, the way we're building new commercial space, construction is really expensive, but most of the time our developers in this region are not expecting big profits off of their commercial space. Um, and if we can get in at the beginning of the pro forma process, really getting that kind of negotiation for inclusionary commercial space, a set aside of micro retail units or a set aside of um, spaces at a certain market below market rate um, to make sure that they're just covering their cost um, would be a great way to get there. So I think this is um, I think this is an important part of it. Another question that came in is about the areas where redevelopment has not really taken foot, east, especially east of the river. These small manufacturing places appear to have been places where there's active and engaged community. How do you work with a disenfranchised area to begin this process? So there are a ton of these businesses east of the river. And I think it's in fact, the best time is to start before the development happens. Um, there's a lot of development and a lot of development plans already going on east of the river, um, having to do with the 11th Street Bridge, having to do with it around the Anacostia Arts Center, 
Um, in fact, we're at a place where local um, businesses are starting to be displaced. So we are in many cases almost late to the game, definitely late to the game uh, east of the river. But I think this is exactly where it works. So when we work with communities, we start with the first two steps, and this is in the book, um, is what outcome are you trying to achieve and who should benefit from it? That who should benefit from it question stumps a lot of people because it's something as planners or economic development leaders, um, it's something we don't often ask uh, or think necessarily think about in a detailed way. Um, so that question of who should benefit, I think has to be asked, especially now. And then the second step is we go and we find them. So we have a system and it's in the book of going out and finding small scale manufacturers in a community because we wanna understand what are their specific needs. What, what works well for them about being in that community and what's challenging about it and what do they need in that next year to succeed and grow even more. And only by understanding their needs can we come back to the real estate sector and say, as you're going forward, you know, we need to create this kind of opportunity or to go to a community development corporation and say, these are the kinds of spaces we need to invest in as a public good, not just affordable housing, but affordable commercial space or production space, because we want to create an opportunity for these businesses to remain in the community. But it is this question of trust, right? I mean, I, I work with an amazing woman who also is at the Anacostia Art Center, uh, Jess Randolph. You know, and and they she created a program where she could provide services to local small product businesses um, and start building up the personal trust because she's in the neighborhood. She's part of the neighborhood. She's you know, and 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 this is where she grew up. And and it is about building up the trust with these businesses that might be home based businesses right now. But if uh, the right kind of space could become available to them with the right kind of support, those three supports I was talking about, right, business development support, affordable real estate and capital, we have to really build this infrastructure with the community. Next question. I'm just going through them as they came in. I'm not, I'm not cherry picking. So if we don't get to everybody, I'm, I'm apologizing now. Um, how do you determine if there's a market for the product someone is making? There's so many people who enjoy making products at home, but what is the market for them? For example, more soap. That's not my job, right? Not I, as planners and as economic development folks, I think our job is to give them the structure, the infrastructure to be able to succeed. Um, it is not our job to decide whether or not a certain small business is going to succeed or not. When a restaurant moves into a neighborhood, you know, we're not going to be the one, or when we give a, a, a permit for a restaurant to move into a neighborhood, we're not deciding if that business is going to succeed. We're making, ideally, we're making it as easy as possible for them to get open so they're not wasting money on that transition process. Same thing with small scale manufacturing. We have, there's amazing trainings for product businesses. Uh, there's a woman out of Chicago who does on demand and live trainings for product businesses. The business, her business is called 37 Oaks, right? So when we, we think about all of the infrastructure we invested in in the DC area for tech businesses, we went, we've gone crazy over the last decade in DC. It's a little bit quieter now, but think about all of the competitions we ran. If anybody's been here and knows all these pieces, the competitions we ran, the spaces we created, the investments that the city put in, Right, there are so many different investments that went into growing the tech sector. If we take those same that same model and apply it to small scale manufacturing, we can create this incredible thriving sector. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small scale manufacturers in our region. I would, in fact, say thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, and you know, the the question of how we support them is is what I think, and and it goes back to those same things is. Do we have business development support and training that is specific to product businesses, just like we created it for tech sector? Are, is there real estate that is affordable and in the right places that supports these businesses growing? Some of them might want to stay as home-based businesses and be full-time at home-based. Right now, storefronts are incredibly unpredictable, so I can understand that. But also people want to be in, in, in a community. They don't want to be out in the middle of, of nowhere. They, so how are we creating spaces for them? And then what kind of access to capital, micro grants, micro loans, um, CDFI funds, being able to be a connector uh, with anchor institutions that could buy products locally, all of these different ways that we can support these outcomes. Next question. We walk by vacant ground floor retail downtown every day. Boy, do we ever. Are there any examples of small manufacturers that have successfully set up shop in the downtown or CBD? How do we encourage promote these uses in the near term? 
DC right now actually has a, a, a comp competition for pop-up spaces in some of the vacant spaces in DC. Um, but you know, knowing that we're part of a broader region and this isn't just about DC, it's about all of the different towns around here. Um, yes, there's a lot of different models. Um, some of them are pop-ups. One of the great ones um, is in Indianapolis. It's called Start Up. It's like ST apostrophe art. Um, and it's really a partnership of the artisan and artistic community, um, which is a pop-up program to compete folks going into different storefronts all over the community. Um, downtown LA also did a series of pop-up spaces that was incredibly successful. Um, so there are pop-up opportunities, but I think the other question is, is how do we build the relationships with some of these institutional property owners to say, this is a moment where you could maybe partner with the city to dedicate a space to small scale manufacturing, to market it as a space for producers, to really create a different kind of destination. We're creating destinations with food halls all over the region right now. We can do the same thing either in partnership or separately with small scale manufacturers where people can be producing and selling in a space. Um, and so really thinking about, it, it all goes back to talking to the small scale manufacturers in an area and understanding their needs, and then really connecting up with the property owners and not just saying, well, we don't know that their needs and we don't know what the property owner needs. It's, it, it, really the vast majority of this is sitting down and having a lot of conversations. The next question that came in is, uh, um, I don't know, it's something about Instagram. So I'm not sure what that question is. Oh as a chapter, got it. How does local government work with private property owners to make these commitments to smaller or micro retail spaces take place? What incentives or partner structures have worked well outside of zoning changes? So the, uh, the project in Brooklyn was a negotiation uh, with between the developer and the city. They proffered um, this ground floor space as far as I understand it. It wasn't part of the deal um, because it's part of a, an art district in Brooklyn area. Um, and that's how that one came about. And it was a 30 year commitment of, of a, a below market rate. So um, I think that's great, but I also think it's, it's great to put something like that out front. So a city could say, um, we will provide a density bonus or we will provide X incentive um, if developers are committing to this kind of space. A lot of times we're finding that developers who've never done this before don't particularly want to go down the route of micro retail space because they've never done it before. And so they want to partner with a third party to do something like that, um, which is fine. There's just not enough partner organizations to do that in every different community. And so um, one of the things that we encourage folks to do is to have the jurisdiction really help start doing that outreach to small scale manufacturers and start building that list of these business owners so that the making the connection between property owners and and protect and potential tenants really can make can be incredibly successful. So um, those are some of the other kinds of incentives there. Um, you know, the other way to get there is looking at uh, the property that the jurisdiction owns. Um, and so when they put out that property for RFP, putting in that kind of space as part of the development requirement is, is really another, another kind of way to get there. Are there any model documents that others can use as templates and build on as they approach their planning departments or county councils? Yes, the book. So Recast Your City, How to Save Your Downtown with Small Scale Manufacturing is full of models. Um, you can also download the worksheets. Um, it's all at recastyourcity.com. Uh, um, and so really thinking about how, um, how we can get there. So I think we have to wrap up. These are phenomenal questions. Um, I'll put my contact information in um, here. So if anybody has any follow-up questions and you wanna reach out, um, you're welcome to reach out to me directly. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, this was great. And thanks for everyone who participated in the chat. Um, would, I would just like to highlight, you know, in addition to going to the website to get the book, we'll also be giving away books. If you follow us on Twitter, um, we're going to do a little trivia at the end of each day of the conference. So look out for that. Um, and please enjoy uh, today's noon session and four o'clock session. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll see you all soon. All right. Bye.